This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Hello and welcome to the Twin Peaks Investing Podcast. My name is Peter Higgins and you can find me at Conquest 3 on Twitter. And I'm here with my good friend Peter at Wheelie Dealer on Twitter. This is Twin Peaks Investing Podcast number 47. It's approximately 6pm in the UK and it's the 21st of the 4th, 2021. We're in April and we were talking last podcast about the ISA season and how it started in Rip Road and we were talking about could we see FTSE 100 in 7,000 and we did hit that, Pete. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm all right. Um, obviously, I'm still still got this ongoing ailment, which is a little bit frustrating, but, but I actually feel really good today. So I, I, that's one of the things that I find really frustrating that some days it's really bad and annoying and other days it's not so bad. So... Anyway, um, yeah, no, the, it, the, the market has, has been really perky last week. I mean, it was, it was lovely, wasn't it, last week? Um, but yesterday, so this is um, Wednesday we're recording this, and it, I think it was yesterday, yeah, Tuesday, that it really came off the boil a bit. But today, you know, there's buyers around again, and there's plenty of blue on the screen, and things look a bit perky again. Not perky, but things... You know they're not falling falling away, so that's that's positive. Yeah, it fell, it fell two percent yesterday, um, and I think people were a little bit taken aback by it. It's like, oh, you know, the market's only going up, and it's like, you know, ladies and gents, this is what happens to the markets. It's it fluctuates. You know, we're in a we're in a situation now where we've managed to touch that magic seven thousand. I think we went just above seven thousand and thirty five or something like that on the sixteenth, yeah. um, and then you know. We get to the the close of the week. Um, we start another week, and then we open up um, Monday. Mm, not so not so bad. Tuesday, not so good. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and wallop. And I think a lots of people are just a little bit taken aback. They were very very quiet on you know because Pete and I are on Twitter a lot. There was very very quiet last night. I thought uh, with regards to people's comments and commentary. I think people are a, a bit stunned, Pete. Yeah, do you know, it's funny though, because when you actually look at the move on the FTSE 100, which appeared to have a really big move, I think a lot of that was down to the weightings, because I noticed that RDSB, you know, Shell, and I think a whole Glencore and a miner, they were hit quite hard. So I think, you know, when you get the mining stocks and the oil stocks hit hard, because of the weightings, it has quite an impact on the FTSE 100. It sort of skews things a bit. So, you know, I think that was coming into play as well. Yeah, but the other I, aspect of it, Pete, as well, was that um, BATS, British American Tobacco, and Imperial Brands, IMB, both got hit as well, and they're quite sub- substantial weightings as well, because there was some talk about they're going to try and reduce um, the sale or stop the sale of um, menthol cigarettes and also reduce the levels of nicotine in cigarettes. So they were both smashed um, by f- more than 5 6% as well. So I think they impacted the, the FTSE as well as the others. Yeah. So you know, and the thing is, I wrote in my blog at the weekend that, you know, you could... That I, I produce loads of charts every, every Sunday night, usually, um, showing all these various things. And... It was so obvious that loads of them were really overbought. I mean, I think some of, I think it was a FTSE 250 was on an RSI of like 78 or 77. These are really high levels because an RSI of 70 is seen as overbought. So, you know, it was obvious that some sort of consolidation, which can mean a bit of a pullback or maybe it can mean going sideways for a while just to unwind those overbought situations. It was obvious it had to happen. It, it, it's, I don't like using the word of obvious it's going to happen, Peter. Mm. The difficulty mm-hmm. is, is that 
the let's, say, let's say highly likely. I, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I think the difficulty is with the markets is that it's been overdue getting back to 7,000, right? So we're, what, a year and a half, 18 months, or whatever it took to get back there. But you look at the time frame of X amount of years, and the, the FTSE 100 has gone nowhere, Pete. You know, yeah. Yeah. From when it first hit 7,000 to where it is now, it's like, how long has that taken? And we're just treading water. Everyone else is going to new highs across, across oh, what say, some of Europe, but most of the US indices have all smashed new highs, you know. So we're, we're just sitting there languishing. It's like, is it our time yet? You know, and then the minute, the minute people start to get excited, as they were last week, um, it it gets to 7,000 and then reverses 2% and people going, oh, you know, it just takes the wind out of your sails a little bit, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting with the, the way that the UK market appears to have lagged because it's only really the FTSE 100 that has lagged and it's also the, I think, AIM is a long way down mm. what its, you know, real peaks were many, many, many moons ago. Um but other than that, I mean, the FTSE 250, we talked about this last week. I think I think that's making new all-time highs, or it's very near it. And I think small caps, of FTSE small caps have done pretty well. Um, so I think the FTSE 100 has been sort of subdued by its own, really because of those weightings, because, you know, the oil stocks have been suffering and, and uh, um, say, miners. And, you know, a lot of these things have not had a great time. And I think that's really skewed it. And then you've had all the Brexit stuff, which didn't help. And, you know, there's so many reasons why the UK market would have dragged. And I do feel that the FTSE 100 is starting to play a bit of catch up and it needs to. It needs to. And I, and I think in time it will, Pete. Um, but I'm hoping it doesn't do so for the wrong reasons. Uh, but I suspect there might be an element of it in a sense of, you know, a lot of our stocks on the FTSE 100 and 250 are lowly valued in comparison to their very richly valued US peers. And I suspect yeah. there's going to be lots of um, deep pocketed companies, not just from the US, but from China, Japan and elsewhere, who are going to come a calling over the next six months to a year. And I think I've said this to you before on this podcast. I suspect we're going to see more takeovers going forward, Pete, of some of the companies that we would look rather stay in um you know stay uk listed and not just be, just be bought up as a bolt-on for some rather large behemoth but i suspect that's what we're going to see pete going forward just an interesting point because i may be wrong but when i think about all of the m a you know mergers and acquisition behavior that there has been in the last year or so i don't think there's been any real mega mergers from the uk have there I don't, I don't remember anything really, really huge from the FTSE 100 being a bid target and actually being taken over. Can you think of any? I can't think of any off the top of my head at the minute. Do you know what I mean, though? So that's Because in a way, that often marks the real peak, doesn't it, when you get a completely ridiculous deal, you know, that that's so ridiculous, it's just ridiculously ridiculous, you know? And I don't think we've really seen that yet. So that's a, that's a treat to look forward to. Yeah, that, you just you just laid it out there, Pete. You know that you know it's going to be happening now, don't you? you I, know. Guess, I guess I guess I guess a good one for that would be the miners, wouldn't it? I mean, they're all saying, "Oh, we're not going to do any stupid M and A anymore, and mm. we're going to be returning cash." I wonder if that is going to be the case as as the as the train moves on down the track, you know. Well, the thing is, the, the miners. I mean, it's funny you say that. They're they're in a very very good position at the minute because you know you remember what three four five years ago how laden with debt they were pete they've mm. reduced that debt significantly now so i suspect you could see some mergers whether it be a mega merger or not i don't i don't, I don't know um but definitely the smaller ones are looking to play catch up and and, and they're looking to, to get together especially the ones that are overseas there, there's a few little mergers going on there um mm. so yeah so that'd be a very interesting space mate definitely to keep an eye on Another um, thing I noticed with the markets, if you look at the Dow Jones, you know, the Dow, yeah. that's been making new all-time highs. If you look at the S&P 500, it's been making new all-time highs. If you look at the NASDAQ 100, which is just the 100 biggest tech companies in the US, that's been making new all-time highs. 
But if you look at the Nasdaq Composite, which is a low, I don't is it 500 stocks? I think it might be. Um, that one might have done a double top. You see it on the chart. I don't know if you've got a chart near you. I haven't got a chart up at the minute, Pete. Just let me just, just, just have a quick look. One I, think sec. I, I think I've got one on my phone here, actually. Yeah, I have. NASDAQ Comp. So, yeah. yeah. The NASDAQ Comp, about two months ago, hit a peak. And it was up around, say, well, I don't know, four, just over 14,000 or something. Yeah, 14,175. Yeah. Yeah. And then just the other day, last week, it hit almost the same level. And then it dropped back. Now, if it can keep rising from here, then we'll avoid a double top. Mm -hmm. If it drops from here, then that would be a double top forming. I mean, it's it's not over because it can go sideways for some time. So it you know it doesn't doesn't mean we all need to panic. But it's just an interesting thing I have noticed. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's got support. Um, Nasdaq Comp's got support at. Yeah, twelve six that twelve thousand six hundred, and if that goes, then you're on your way down to to twelve, and if that goes, you're down to eleven. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's I mean it's from from its highest peak, it's only it's only three hundred points uh, from its um, all time highs, and that you you know what the, the the US is like that could be done this week, you know if it yeah. if something yeah. positive came out, you know we've still got a few earnings to come out this season, uh, th this um this this week and this month. Um, some, for some large companies out there. So if a couple of them come out with something, you know, mega, the Nasdaq will just go pop. It can do 300 points in a couple of days, mate. There was something else I noticed on the Nasdaq, technically. Um, this concept of, of bearish RSI divergence. So that's where you get the share price chart is rising, yeah, but the... RSI chart, and I'm talking about the daily RSI, it's like its peaks are getting successively lower. So it's like the share price is rising, but the RSI is sort of falling. And that is evident on the NASDAQ composite. And that can be quite a good predictor of something happening ahead that's, that's bearish. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just on the watch. I mean, you know, it's not right every time. None of these things are. But it's just, you know, just other factors. And then throw in the fact that, you know, a lot of NASDAQ stocks, particularly the smaller end, are looking a bit pricey. But Pete, this goes back to what we said before. You know, some of these tech stocks have been looking pricey for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah you've had people out there shorting Apple at one stage, shorting Amazon at one stage, shorting Tesla more recently. That's what having so many shorts on it. And, you know, it shook them all off. You know, it's rolled over a little bit recently for a variety of different reasons. Um, but, you know, a lot of people have been hurt shorting stocks. This is the thing. You know, if you're getting margin called on a stock because you've shorted it, then, you know, it's not a good place to be, mate. Because, you know, the problem is, is that you're there shorting the stocks. You think, oh, it's overvalued, it's overvalued, it's overvalued. And then Pop comes out with some news and it's up five, ten. You know, all these people that are shorting it are creating that additional spike in the share price, Pete. You know, or that company is, is being attacked by another company in the sense of, I want to merge with you, I'm offering this premium price. It goes up five, ten, twenty percent on a premium takeover. And you as a shorter are getting absolutely smashed across the rocks again. So you know, it's, 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 it's hard, Pete. Hard to hard to short. I think shorters are at the mercy, really. I think you're better off sometimes finding a stock that's got a bit of momentum and going long, you know. But that's how the, the companies make the most money, don't they, these spread betting companies? Do you know, I, I think you, you, you've absolutely nailed it there. I think in a market as bullish like as this is, I just don't see the point of shorting individual stocks. I mean, I think there might be occasions where hedging a portfolio by going short on an index is valid, and I do that myself. But only sparingly, I'm trying to do that. But in terms of short and individual stocks, I just think it's so dangerous to do. No, I, 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 I agree. I agree with you. I agree with you, Pete. And, and it's like you said, it's like there's no need to. You know, why bother shorting stocks when you can make so much money going long? I think part I think of it, I, I, I think part of it though is that you and I see stocks and we just scratch our heads, going, "What is going on there?" Mm. You know, how can that be that price? 
you know that price is ridiculous in comparison to the revenue that price is ridiculous look at the look at the sheer sheer size of that pe on that stock and it just beggars belief pete so you know so we then think to ourselves right okay that's it i'm i'm done here right i'm going short this stock right i'm going short tesla and we're yeah. shorting it at i've been out on that one <laughs> we're going short at 600 it goes to 620 650 680 700 it can't never it could oh this is ridiculous it can't go to 800 bosh it gets to 800 and you're there going well if you've got any money left <laughs> you know what i mean you're going Whoo. so it's just it's just hard work mate i mean I, i've got i've got a, a um a list of stocks which i am i've been having this little discussion with myself pete about yeah. reopening uh, and i know you want to talk about it in, in a little while my spread bet account because there's a couple of stocks pete that i'm looking at across the FTSE and across AIM, and I'm going, that is just madness. Oh, so you're thinking like a short, yeah? I'm, think, I'm thinking I'm thinking about I haven't done a, a, a spread bet short for years. Mm. Yeah, I haven't done a spread bet probably for a couple of years because I haven't bothered with it account at all. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what, at some point when this rolls over, it's going to get absolutely massacred. You know, the last stock I wanted to short was probably Fever Tree, you know, when it was in its 30s and, and, then, and then got to 40. And I didn't. You know, and I know what's going to happen. If I turn around and say, oh, I'm shorting that stock, there'll be hell to pay on Twitter because yeah. that particular stock or that particular stock is going to be loved by somebody or other or a group of core of people. And how dare me short that stock? But I can go long it. I can say I'm going long it and they'll be all happy and rejoicing. How dare I say I go short it? Oh, crikey. Even, even if it's completely madness to go long, yeah. <sighs> Do you know, it's funny, actually, talking about a stock that looks... I don't know, I'm... I'm in two minds about this one. Actually, I'm going to have a look at the chart as I'm talking. Um, you know S4 Capital, yeah? Yeah. Now, I get the story, you know, it makes sense to have online marketing and all that stuff, and the world's going digital and all this kind of thing, and I totally get that. But what I'm struggling with is that, you know, apart from... Um, Martin Sorrell and the and the the fantastic you know kudos that he brings and whatever. I look at the valuation and stuff and I just think, what on earth? So you're roughly talking a three billion pound market capitalization, yeah. And you're talking sales. So we're not talking profit. We're talking sales, right? Of about three hundred and forty-two million in the last results. Now, I can't help thinking that that is a very inflated valuation. I mean, you know, if you're doing 342 million of sales, what are you going to be doing in terms of profit? Are you going to be doing 50 million maybe at, at the most? I'm probably being generous there, aren't I? And yet you've got a 3 billion market cap. I mean, if you're talking 50 million profit on 3 billion market cap, it's just I can't even work the PE out. It's too big. You know what I mean? And I can't help thinking that all of the continual acquisitions and share issuance and debt and all the rest of it is hiding what's really going on. And I think if I had that stock, I think, you know, a lot of people have done really well on it and fair play to your people. Well done. You know, that's brilliant. But what I would say is don't get too greedy and perhaps just trim a bit off because I just think it's it just looks a bit precarious to me. It's an interesting company, Pete, and I, I interviewed Sir Martin Sorrell last year. Oh, you did? Yeah, you yeah, did. Yeah, he's an absolutely fascinating, fascinating character. Yeah. And he has Good. got the, the media network. I, want, I don't want to say in, in the palm of his hand, but he, he, he was Mr. Media, wasn't he, back in the day? And he still is. And for, for, for me, S4 Capital is, 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 is a pure... Pure, pure digital play on media. And a lot of these, these behemoths have got so much additional cost which that company doesn't have. So it's a pure tech play on media. Um, is it worth three million? I don't know, Pete. You know, three the, billion. The, 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 yeah, three billion. Three billion, yeah, sorry. Um, it's up nearly 200% in the past 12 months. Yeah. He uses um, the valuation of the company and then goes to purchase in stock that the next purchase, the next purchase, 50% of it is always in stock. 
and then it's a case of I'm buy we're merging. Sorry, I'm buying this. Com- we're, we're buying you, and you're buying you're buying into my company's ethos. You're not flipping the shares after a year or three years. This is it. You're part of this, is, and that's part of the conversation that they're having. So these companies are bought in, and they're they're staying in as part of the company, not looking to flip, buy, and sell out after a couple of years. And it's and it's interesting. It's a very interesting model, Pete, and it's worked thus far. Um, mm. Interestingly, you've got um, I think it's. Piper Jeffries has got a, a price target of something like seven pounds on the stock as we speak, Pete. So what um, are they now? Um, five pound and eighty or something, stuff like that. Okay, it's a bit Sorry. more. Yeah. Um, and Morgan Stanley got got it at seven pounds, seven pounds price target. And Jeffries, what's Jeffries got it at? Um, they've reduced theirs from six pounds seventy to 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 six pounds. They've just have they recently bought another one as well, Strike Force or something like that. Oh, they're buying all the time. I mean, they're I think, you know, time, mate. yeah, yeah, it's, it's very acquisitive. It's a model that's worked before and he wants to get that company um, S4 bigger or as big as WPP, which he built over umpteen years. And mm. I, you know what, Pete, having listened to him, having researched him, he's the sort of guy that could do it. He really could. Yeah, no, it's fair play. I mean, I guess if you're looking for something in that space, in that digital marketing space and whatever i mean even wpp might be worth looking at because it's it's shifting more towards digital but better ones perhaps is um nfc next 15 communications it's a smaller one Mm -hmm. and i think there's also um the mission group tmg which used to be the mission marketing. I think that one's quite interesting. They're both small ones, but, yeah. but you know, they could, I think if I was a buyer today, they would be more interesting to me than S4, which looks like a lot of the good, easy, lower risk gains have been had. And now it's getting to the stage where, okay, if I held it, I'd probably hold it and I might trim a bit off. But I don't think I'll be buying it up here. Yeah, I think it goes back to what we were saying before, Pete. You know, we, we've we've been fortunate enough to have had a really, really significant bounce since last March, April time. Yeah, there's very few stocks that are, you know, that have done badly over the past twelve months, um, mm. share price wise, unless they're absolutely, you know, diabolical companies. Um, you know, and we'll exclude, you know. Um, AstraZeneca out of that diabolical company <laughs> because it's not done so well over the past 12 months but um, I it's not today inter- nicely mate it's, it's coming back a bit it's coming back a bit um, I was reading what a what a, a good mate of mine Guy Guy Gudeidos I think his name is also I never I never know how to pronounce it um, Guy he, he sent me something from that Jim Cramer had written talking about how healthcare stocks had sort of been left behind a bit and that healthcare stocks might be worth looking at again. Now, we all know Jim Cramer's a bit of a character and stuff, but he does get some calls bang on dead right. And I think there could be a lot of sense in that. And if you look at AstraZeneca and you look at Glaxo, they've both really had shocking years when everything else has done really well. And there's nice, big, solid, value, defensive, healthy kind of plays. You know, they're probably worth looking at. They probably are, Pete. Um, I've got my, my my fill of that that sort of space, and I'm oh, I've got. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm more in the the tech space. I'll tell you about a stock that I've I've bought, which is not not necessarily a tech tech stock, but more a finance stock a bit a bit later on. Yeah. Um, but before before I do that, Pete, I wanted to talk um, and and thank all of our listeners. Um, firstly, um, for our fantastic feedback um, that we keep getting, and we've had we have got. Uh, from people this week um, and bizarrely I don't, I don't know who you are or where you are well I do know some of you because you've, you've sent us DMs and we've, you've sent us um, Twitter replies some of you actually loved Peter's joke ah, uh, yeah yeah all two of them dealer, dealer's joke and I don't, I mean, I'm like really guys ladies what's that about <laughs> oh dear oh that's that's the only laugh that's ever heard Mate, so, you know, so the, the, what I was going to say, and I had this conversation with Pete, you know what, if you've got some good jokes, right, what we'd ask you to do is send send them via, to D, DM them to Peter, at Wheelie Dealer on Twitter, DM him, right, don't put it on open Twitter, and then Pete can have a little look through some of those jokes, and maybe share the best ones occasionally, I'll, I'll... Just, to, just to lift spirits going forward. 
I'll use my incredible skills at joke delivery to make <laughs> sure that they really, they really hit the spot with a punchline. Absolutely. Uh, the other aspect of what I wanted to say thank you for as well, ladies and gents, was just just the sheer number of you individuals um, following our last conversation about the Twin Peaks Challenge and us raising money for the Memphis Charity for Disabled Children. Uh, we had at the time um, 23 supporters and donations. Two of those were Pete and I, so we had 21 in effect. Um, we've now um, doubled that number almost. We've now got 45 supporters, excluding me and Pete, that's 43 um, that we've got. And we've now um, moved on from the total of, um, I think it was £1,080, I think was the last total. We've now moved up to £1,515.80, pence, excluding gift aid. So I just wanted to thank all of you that have uh, made a donation. Some of you have, have done it anonymously. Um, some of them have said your names and, and, and given uh, a little comment. Um, one of you, um, LR, has said, love your podcast, your honest and candid discussions on the markets and mental well-being, etc. are a great tonic. Plus the odd gem to go and, and diligence. Keep up the good work, guys. Um, so thank you for those comments and thank you for the donations and hopefully we can do the charity some good um, by raising a significant more um, amount going forward. So if you're thinking about donating, please do so. And if you can spare a pound um, going forward to the charity, every pound counts uh, towards this charity and just just surviving and helping people in the community. So if you can, just find the um, Just Giving page, justgiving.com forward slash fundraising. Twin Peaks Challenge and make a donation. That'd be very much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, and the other the other way you can find it is if you go to my website um, on the www.weeblydealer2.weebly.com. Um, if you go on there and go to the Twin Peaks Investing Podcast page, right at the top there is a link that will take you to it. And thank you to everyone who's donated, and thank you to everyone who's going to donate and whatever. And you know, it's we're, we're, let's be fair, we're a lot of us are making money very easily at the moment, and you know it's 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 good to give a bit back. And uh, remember, you are appeasing the market gods, and if you look after the market gods, they'll look after you. That's really important to remember. That's a very very good point there, Pete. I mean, not that I'm even remotely religious or, or <laughs> superstitious or anything like that. Well, I, I am religious, mate. That's how I've been brought up. But I think part of it as well, Pete, is that. You know, we were talking about financial freedoms last week and one of the most important aspects of, of, of financial freedom to me, other than the time to do whatever I want, is what I do in, in and around my community, locally and nationally, all the different charitable causes and, and, and other aspects of what I do in the community. That's what's more important to me. That's where my passion is, you know. So, well, yeah, that's, that's something you enjoy doing. and it's, I, I, it's, I love it, Pete. Yeah. I mean, the thing for me, and I had a conversation with, with one of the guys I've been working with for, for many, many years, and um, it's, it's really, really Im important, really, that no... I mean, this thing about no one gets left behind. Lots of people have been left behind already, Pete. We were having the conversation okay. just before we came on air. You know, it's one of the, company, one of the charities that I work with are dealing with homelessness and mental health. It's staggering, Pete. You know, and it's not just people who... Um, had mental health issues before or were homeless before because of COVID and because of lockdown lots of people are stressed, have got levels of anxiety don't want to return to work, they've become homeless we've got a big, big issue going forward Pete in our society regarding people and the people that have unfortunately been left behind You know, we're talking about self-employed people before Pete who've mm. not had any financial support whatsoever, the vast majority of them had nothing oh, it, 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 I mean I just yeah. I just feel for these, like these people who are running small businesses and that, it, it, it must just be horrendous. I mean, we were talking actually before we started doing the recording of this podcast, we were talking about the idea of having um, sort of hobbies and interests and things you do outside of your investing life and your your family life and your work life and all that kind of stuff. and. You know, I'm a real big believer in this. I think if you, I, I think there's a real danger with, I think there's a lot of us who are sort of like passionate hobbyists with our investments and we really enjoy doing it. We absolutely love doing it. And I think that in itself can be quite dangerous. And it's like, you know, you can end up doing too much of it. I mean, I know so many people 
who spend their lives sat in front of a screen every second of the day looking at their stocks and putting on trades and taking off trades and putting on trades and taking off trades and, and doing all this stuff and basically just all they're doing is frying their brains and they're not making any more money through doing it or they might be making a, a little bit more money but what's the point you know it's like you're wasting your life you're burning your life away get and find another interest outside of investing like, like me go down the pub you know just do something different and just get away from it and and just just give your brain space to think about other things it will make you a better investor it'll make you a better trader agreed agree with that that wholeheartedly pete even if it's just going for a walk into the countryside mate you know yeah. bathe in nature and do that as often as you possibly can and just you know be amongst and away from every single sort of electric electrical little device that you can be for half an hour you know just get away from all the noise and get away from the everyday life and just think about other things it definitely helps yeah it sure does sure does you wanted to talk about um selling things didn't you I did a little bit. I, th I think, you know, given what we were talking about when we first started this conversation uh, about how the markets are doing and, and the markets have been doing well and so on and so forth, I think there's so much written, Pete, about how to buy, how to, to, to use fundamental analysis, how to use technical analysis. But I just wanted to talk briefly about when to sell. I think it's that discussion which we, we very rarely have as investors, and I think it's something we, we struggle with. You know, when, when do we see something as, as overvalued? When are we being objective regarding a particular stock? You know, mm. it's going up and therefore we're like, oh, it's great, it's great, it's great, it's great. But I think what we have to do sometimes is be mindful. And it, it's, it, there's loads of old sayings, you know, about uh, about various things and phrases like um, we, we, we sell the rips and buy the dips. Have you heard that one, Pete? Yeah. I hadn't actually heard that. I like it's that. Very, it's a very, very What's American it? one. We Buy the rips and sell the dips. Yeah. Um, let your winners run, but cut your losers short. You heard that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. We yeah. all know that one. Yeah. No one ever went broke taking a profit. You heard that one? Oh, I just think it's such nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, most of these I just don't agree with. I hate them. Yeah. But, but I mean, the, the, the thing is, for, for me, there's a few things that I, I look at in a sense of, and I think other people should look at, um, the first thing you've got to identify is what kind of investor are you? Yeah. yeah? Are you a momentum investor? Are you a dividend investor? Are you a long-term investor? Are you a short-term investor? And so on and so on and so on and so forth. Or in fact, are you a trader? Because traders will be buying and selling, buying and selling all the time. They don't, they don't care. But if you're actually an investor, the idea is to buy a stake in that company. You're investing in that company. So you've done your research. You're and you've, you've found out a little bit more about the company than ordinarily you would, yeah? And you're looking to invest it. Now, you're looking to invest it now for two years, three years, four years, five years, or you're looking to invest in that stock for a goal or a catalyst. And once yeah. that's happened, you know, you're like, okay, I'm out of it now. I mean, you spoke briefly, Pete, about um, S4. Yeah. yeah. If you bought it last year at two quid or two and a half quid, and it's now nearer to six, and the PE is now even higher than it was when it was at two. Mm. Yeah, and the, and the revenue growth hasn't really matched up to that. Are you still chasing that? In a sense of, like you say, waiting for it to go to, to six, seven, eight pounds? Or are you thinking, oh, it's time to get out? Or are you just watching the momentum and thinking, actually, the momentum's still there, so I'm going to continue to, to, to hold the stock? Yeah? Well, I, me personally, as I said before, I would be slicing. If I held it, and I still thought, there was upside i would slice some off and just yeah. take some risk off the table and and this and this is the important element about looking at why did you buy the stock in the first place what are you looking for it to achieve you know are you actually looking for it to achieve the you know that growth where it becomes that 10 billion pound stock because you know this is what this is what happened with wpp when you know sir martin sorrow was there he grew it from nothing all the way up there i mean granted he was there a bit longer um, than he's been in S4, but you know, some people are bought into that story and are looking to be there for the for the long haul, you know. And you know, you know that's, this... that's a really interesting point because I think, right, this is just complete conjecture based on nothing, right? I think S4 capital could get to ten quid, and it more than likely will happen. 
But I'll tell you another thing. I don't think it's going to go to 10 quid in a straight line. I think it's going to go up to, I don't know, six, seven, whatever. Then it's going to fall back. Then it's going to get in another uptrend at some point in the future. And I think that's the kind of typical route these things take. They don't get straight up to 10 billion pounds, which is three times where it is now. They don't do that straight away. Well, they do sometimes, but it's incredibly rare. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I, I completely agree with you. And this is why, I mean, it's a bit like buying, Pete. There's no right or wrong answer to when to sell, right? It's a mm. very personal thing, right? So you have to decide, why did you buy it in the first place? And what's the price of it now? And am I happy with the profit that I've made? And if you're happy with the profit you've made, there's nothing wrong with you trimming, selling, or whatever. And one of the main reasons why people... Um, decide to trim or to reduce or to sell out is to rebalance something you know in their portfolio yes. if it gets too big in their portfolio and they've got yes. that you know quite fixed mentality you know th this stock I'm not these stocks in my portfolio I'm not going to allow them to be to become anything bigger than five percent of my portfolio or ten percent of my portfolio because I'm not going to allow that risk and each time it yeah. gets to five percent or ten percent they reduce it accordingly they reduce it accordingly. They reduce it accordingly, and at some point or other, they might decide to sell out. Yeah, so that's that's one way of, of looking at it. The other reasons why people sell is because that company has been sitting in their, their portfolio. It's done reasonably well, but it's now things are cooling off, and they spot a better opportunity either in the same niche or a completely different niche of the market, and they decide to sell that particular company that they've got and then buy something new, or as has happened to me recently, a couple of stocks do well and decide to get rid of them. But the other aspect of it is, is when there's a profit warning. Yeah, a profit oh, yeah. warning comes yeah. and it hits the stock by and it goes down 15, 20, 25 percent. I'm then thinking, you know what? Is this a significant profit warning, which is going to keep the company at these levels for, for more than a year, a year and a half or whatever? Or is it something where they can go back and win back those contracts or or, or do even better from a lower base? So then I might decide to add or I might decide to, to get out. I mean, the way I look at it is if there's something to do with um, accountancy, Pete, yeah? Oh, or, yeah. That's, or that's or, what or, or and even a hint of fraud, yeah. I'm out. I'm gone. Bye-bye. Yeah. I don't care if I've done 20 hours research on it or 100 hours research. If yeah. there's a hint of fraud or accountancy stuff, I'm out of there. You know, so that's my trigger. But you have to find – I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that you have to find your own rules as to why you're selling – don't tell. Don't allow someone else to influence you buying or sell it, uh, selling a share. And you know, circumstances change. So it doesn't matter how much you love that company or whether it's a massive p part of your portfolio or not. You've got to take it and be objective and decide. Actually, things have changed with the earnings company, or actually, it is overvalued. So therefore, I'm selling. Yeah. So to think about that, I think the other last thing I'd say as well is that and this might be the reverse of selling when you're mm. thinking of buying a stock that new stock because you've sold something yeah and lots of people are talking about this stock and this stock is going up ask these people on twitter or social media what's their average buying price for this stock that they keep talking about and they keep buying right because if that stock's gone from three pounds yeah to 23 pounds and they've been buying it all the way maybe their average price is 15 pounds yeah maybe their average price is 20 pounds for all the buying yeah. that they've been doing but it's very rare that people say, actually, this is the price that I bought it originally because the share price has gone up 300, 400% and they're still encouraging people to buy in that stock. And maybe that's what they shouldn't be doing. They should be saying, actually, my average price is there. Would I buy it now? No, but I'm happy to keep it. I'm holding it still. See, I think this comes back to, to a really um, fundamental point that, you know, if you're buying something because someone else is talking about it, then you, you, you're just a copycat. You're not, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to say you should never copy anyone. And, and you know, there are, I mean, I get, lo I copy ideas. I get loads of good ideas from other people, but I then take those ideas and they go through my own analysis and filtering and, and how they fit in the portfolio and all that kind of stuff. I never just buy something because someone else bought it who's a great investor. I know many great investors, some really good ones, and they buy stocks all the time. But I'm not going to buy it just because they bought it. And they might even say to me, Pete, you should look at this stock. 
I'm still going to take it away and properly analyse it. I'm not just going to willy-nilly buy it. And I think I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. I think a lot of people won't trust their own judgment. And it's almost like they need that confirmation bias of someone else telling them what to buy. And I think that's a habit you've really got to get out of. You've got to make your own decisions. You've got to do your own analysis. It doesn't matter what someone else paid for a stock in the sense that each stock that you're looking at must stand up on its own merits. It's got to be a great company. It's got to be, you know, having upward momentum or whatever it's doing. And it's still got to have an attractive valuation. If it doesn't have that kind of stuff, then, you know, you shouldn't be looking at it. That's a very, very good point, mate. You've made it well there. The other thing I'd, I would say as well, Pete, um, with regards to people looking for ideas, I think it's important to, to qualify as well who and whom these ideas are coming from. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Because there are some people, um, and you and I know several, that are really, really good at researching stocks. They're really, really good at writing articles about certain stocks. There's good people that are writing various different magazines that we that we know um, that write really good articles, do deep, deep, deep research, you know, including my, my good friend Phil Oakley at Investors Chronicle and Algie Hall as well. Um, oh, yeah. and, and Mary McDougall, who's, who's writing some fantastic stuff as well. There's some really, really good people out there. And, you know, I, I learned a lot of my tech savviness from Steve Fraser at Shares Magazine. You know, yep. and that's yep. the person that got me really, really deep into into um, tech stocks, and I'll and I'll always be grateful to, for Steve for that. Um, so, to all of that, there's so much information out there now. I think it's important that we all take a time, take the time that we've got. And some people haven't got time because of busy lives and all the rest of it. But you know what? If we can spend as much time as we spend on t Twitter, we can take the time as well to read mm. a book, to read a bit of research, to find out a bit more about the stock. You know, because there's some companies out there, people don't even know who the CEO and CFO are or the different subsidiaries of the company, but they bought it because they saw one tweet about it and one person that they liked said it was a good stock. And then the next minute it's down 25, 35, 40% in a heartbeat and they're going, oh! And they're wondering why, yeah. And they're wondering why. So yeah. I just think it's, you've got to be careful out there and just, you know, take the time to know what your where your money's going i think the important bit that always sticks in my mind is something my you know my my, my greatest mentor ever shared with me and this is my dad right <laughs> is that when you when i first started investing Pete, right it mm. was a case of okay how much have you, how much have you spent on that right and i'd say he's like really you bought you spent that much was, was your like, dad yeah. an investor He's got one stock in his portfolio, Pete, and it's a company he worked for for I think it was forty-two years, right? And he has got Croda shares, right? Wow. And when he was when he was in the company, he was he was he was investing whatever per month, and he'd get one one free share for every one he bought. Yeah, yeah. And I always isn't it? CRDA, yeah. And I've always liked the company, but something in the back of my mind was I refused to buy the share ever. Because he was getting it essentially at half price. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I always refused to buy it and it's done phenomenally well. And he sits there and he chuckles to himself every single time. Yeah. Um, but the thing my dad was saying to me as well, and this, is, this, this goes back to the hours of research for me now, right, Pete, is that you think about how much you buy a stock for. Some people are buying stocks and investing £500, right? Mm -hmm. Some people are investing £5,000. And he said to me one day, and it stuck in my head, right, how much time did it take you to earn that amount of money? And if you broke that down to every hour, I would ask everybody that's out there that's listening to this podcast, male, female, wherever you are in the world, have a think about the largest stock purchase you've made or amount you've got invested in that one stock and break it down to when you last work. How many hours of work and toil did you have to do to get that money after you paid all your tax and expenses? And you'll be surprised. You go, whoa. Then take a step back and think, how much time did I spend to research that stock before I made that sizable investment? That will get you thinking, Really good folks. point. Really good point. Joe, I was just looking at the Croda share chart, yeah, um, just out of interest. And uh, on a three-year chart, one-year chart if you like, um, it's just broken out. So it looks to me like, Technically, it looks like it's going to go higher. I mean, I don't know anything particularly about the company or the valuation or whatever. 
But if you're holding Crowder, I, I wouldn't be selling it yet because it looks like it's probably going to go higher. Yeah, he, he, whenever I speak to him, I said, oh, Dad, I've been keeping your eye on, you know, eye on your Crowder shares. He's like, don't need to keep an eye on them for me, Pete. I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. <laughs> you know what uh, I mean? And he, probably, and he, 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 he bugs me. Never he, I've been saying to him for years, I said, are you reinvesting them dividends? And it only by every other dividend he gets, he reinvests it. I'm thinking, you're worth an absolute fortune now. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's funny actually because there's a there's a very good reason for you not investing in Crowder, and that is simple diversification, isn't it? Well, I mean, the bizarre thing is, Pete. Up until I was about what? I mean, bearing in mind I left home at fifteen, Pete, and I didn't really get on with him back back then, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I did. I knew he worked at Crowder. I didn't even know what that Crowder was a share or a company <gasps> that was listed. Didn't know anything about it until you know I was in my twenties and I started talking to him a bit better and we got on a bit better, and and then I was like, whoa, how many of those you got? crazy mate did crazy. that did that get you into investing a bit not at all okay yeah not at all i, I shared my, my story and how i got invested in in the um investors chronicle interview that i did with um john newman and and phil oakley and to cut a long story short i i just Don't saw you. a chat yeah. no i'll tell you just one little synopsis of it pete i was in the royal air force on a train going back from Kings Lynn to Manchester, long journey on the train, different trains, different kind of chop, chop and change, all the rest of it. And I saw somebody with a very large pink paper. Ah, the Financial Times. Right. Hey. Well, it's either that or the Gay Times. I'm not sure. <laughs> don't, don't be like that, mate. Yeah. And that, that was... Oh, we're going back to... Oh, crikey. Mm. 91, maybe 1990, Pete, when I first saw yeah. that paper. 91, 92. I'm losing track now. It's that time of day of the day. When I first saw that, and I've been consuming every book I've, I've, I could get hold of ever since, mate. Wow. That's how I got into investing. Because when you look at the Financial Times as a non-investing person or as a kid or whatever, it just looks like gobbledygook, doesn't it? It's yeah, just... It just I looks like maths, total nonsense. You know, I, 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 lo I loved I loved maths, and all I saw on, on the back was fractions and numbers and fractions yeah. and numbers. And I was thinking, what does all this mean? And that was me hooked, mate, from then on. Does it, you know, you know, like the Financial Times, can you can you still buy, like, the paper copy, do you know? I believe so, yeah. I believe but so. But does it please. still print, like, all the share prices and stuff? Like I believe so. I've not, I've not physically bought my own copy for a, a long time. Yeah, I haven't, I've never... Well, yeah, I think I think I they get, are. I yeah, think it's, yeah. it's just so traditional because remember, you used to go into all these financial firms; it'd always be there in the foyer. You know, always be a copy of the FT. In yeah, the foyer. yeah. Well, where I used to work at Fujitsu, they used to have a, a copy of it. In, you know, in the in the waiting area, and I used to quite often go there and have a little nose at it. You know. Yeah, most definitely. Wow, well, better than working, <laughs> but hide down there for half an hour. Well. Now, oh, Pete, wow. did, you, did you want to cover a little... I mean, you've been asking me and badgering me for, for weeks now. Do you do you want to cover a little bit of this spread betting thing or do you want to leave it Yeah, yeah, we need, to, we, need to talk it. A bit, we need to talk a bit about spread betting because I've had a lot of people asking me about it because I sort of do it completely weird how everyone else does it. And I think, I think one of the things I find strange with spread betting is that a lot of people are very good stock investors and share investors, Yeah. And then they decide they're going to do spread betting, and all of a sudden they become a trader. And I find that a bit strange, and, and it, it doesn't really make any sense to me. So what I try to do is basically I try to treat my spread bets like I treat my shares. So, so the main thing I, I'll do is I effectively create a mirror portfolio out of spread bets. So... I have my, say I've got my normal portfolio with, say, 40 stocks in it, yeah? In theory, what I would do is replicate that as spread bets. Now, obviously, you can do it different sizes. I think for me personally, I think I probably do about half the size in spread bet exposure as I would in normal shares. So let's say, for instance, say I bought some shares in... British Aerospace, you know, BAE Systems. If it's shares in BAE Systems, BA dot, yeah. Um, if I bought normal shares in there, and let's say for argument's sake, I bought 10 grand's worth, 10,000 quid's worth of BA normal shares, I would then buy 5,000 pounds worth, so half the amount, 5,000 pounds worth, 
equivalent of spread bets, yeah, which is basically the share price times the amount per point that you're betting on it, yeah. Um, so what I'm doing is is like I'm recreating another portfolio, but as spread bets. Now you're going to say to me, well, what's the point of that? Well, what it means is that if you use spread bets, you get the advantages of leverage of gearing. So to buy ten thousand, um, to buy five thousand pounds worth of, of of normal shares, you would need five thousand pounds. To buy five thousand pounds worth of spread bets, you'd probably only need a thousand quid as your margin deposit. And and if the shares go up or if the shares go down, you have the same impact as if you had normal shares. So um, so it so it gives you really nice leverage. Um, it's also tax free, um, and it also has the big advantage that. When you get it right and when you make your spread bet portfolio work, it throws off cash like you can't imagine. So for me personally, who you know, I don't I don't work or anything, and I rely on my income that I get from investing in shares and things. One of the problems with a normal share portfolio is that you have to sell shares to get your hands on cash, yeah? So you sell the shares, it becomes cash, you then take the cash out of your portfolio. With spread bets, when they do well, and you've got to know what you're doing, you have to manage your total exposure rigidly, and I'll talk about that more in the future, I'm sure. Um, it throws off cash. So you can just easily take out chunks of cash, which is what I do, um, And but you must monitor the situation. I have a limit. So... Let's say for argument's sake, keep it simple. Let's say I had a limit of, say, say 100,000 quid would be my limit of spread bet exposure. So if I'm doing well, let's say I, let's say I started the year on 80,000 pounds of long exposure, which is made up of loads of individual shares, yeah? I've got that total exposure of spread bets of 80,000 um, pounds. If it then did well and it kept going up and it got to £100,000 of exposure, if it went over, I would then be selling some of the spread bet positions because it's so dangerous to let it get over your limit and to lose control of it. So, so, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. so, so is that you trying to manage your, the risk to, or the levels of exposure there, Pete, is it? Totally, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because if you let it run away, it will absolutely kill you. You know, because it's because it's it's very easy. You know, you start off with say eighty thousand quid's worth of long exposure. It gets up to hundred. You're doing really well. Gets up to hundred and twenty. You're doing really well. Gets up to hundred and thirty, hundred and forty. It's climbing and climbing and climbing. Your risk is climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing. When something goes wrong, when the markets crash, which they inevitably will, you're going to get yourself absolutely killed. So, so you got to manage that exposure so that's when you get your margin calls and so on and so forth i think my concern with the spread betting bit and what and why i've been reluctant to talk about it on the on this particular podcast being an investing podcast pete but also about the the, the, the old nuances of it is that these spread betting companies the vast majority of them their margins their profit margins are huge because they they are profiting and profiteering from us you me and everybody else that does spread bet losing there's far more people that I, that I see on Twitter talking about spread bet losses than there are winners, you know. Well, that's that's exactly it. And, and, and it comes back to what I said before. I think if you treat it like you treat your normal shares, and this is on the assumption that you are normally a pretty solid, pretty decent share investor, if you treat it exactly the same way, and do it as exposures and have a diverse portfolio of spread bets. I think that's where a lot of people go wrong, right? If you had a share portfolio, you would hold, I don't know, 20, you know, 15, 20, 30, 40 stocks, whatever you hold in your portfolio, yeah? For some reason, when people start doing spread bets, they'll only have one or two bets. So that's like having your share portfolio with just two stocks in it. Well, you wouldn't do it, would you? Yet for some reason, once you start doing spread bets, you start doing that. And the problem with that 
is if you adopt an approach of just having these individual bets, you lose all the diversification benefits which normally naturally occur in your portfolio. So let's put it this way, right? If, it, if I talk about any individual share that I hold, I never know from one year to the next which of my shares will do well and which of my shares will do badly. I haven't got a clue. I like to think that majority of the shares I buy will do okay and some of them will do badly and that's just the way it is. But I can't really identify which ones are which very well. So what I, what I do know is that I have a track record going back many, 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 many years that I'm achieving around 10% on my normal share portfolio. So, that, so, so all the shares combined generate me 10%. How that's made up, I've no idea, yeah? But I'm getting that 10% return. But the point is, if you're getting that same 10% return on a spread bet portfolio, and it's slightly more complicated because you've got interest rates and things like that that come into it as well, you have an interest charge, but if you're doing 10% on your normal portfolio, there's no reason why you can't do 7% on the exposure in your spread bet portfolio. If you're doing 7% on the exposure, that actually equates to probably 40-50% capital return on, so, on so, the so, deposit so, and cash you're using. So let me so, ask the question that most people are going to want me to ask you then, Pete. Yeah. G given you're, you're looking at 10% across your portfolio, investing wise what's your return or what's your average return over the past whatever time frame you want to use for your spread betting account what sort of returns you've been averaging there right i've been hampered in the last two years two years no th sorry last year i did well in my spread bet account this year now i'm doing very nicely in my spread spread bet account for the two years before that i was hampered because I was doing loads of experiments in how to hedge. Now, we, I'm, we'll talk about hedging in another podcast probably. Yeah, I've written about hedging to a massive extent on my website. If you go to the educational blogs page and go to the um, category hedging, there's just absolutely loads written about it. Um, so the hedging skewed what I was doing. Yeah, If you were to strip out the hedging aspect of what I was doing, I would suspect that that portfolio is doing 30, 40% a year return on capital employed. Okay, okay. Now, as we speak, yeah, mm -hmm. as we speak, my share portfolio is probably up about, say, 13%, 14% for this actual year, yeah. My spread bet portfolio is up about 35% return on capital. Okay. Employed. But, but I have had a few hedge trades. And, of course, the, the, the challenge with hedge, hedge trades, if the, they're there to protect my portfolio, yeah? If they go wrong, I'm getting a hit. I'm losing money on them because the, the stop losses are getting hit or I'm closing them early, whatever. So I've had a few where I've had that hit. But the reason I hedge is it actually enables me to take on more long exposure in my spread bet account with less capital being used. Right. But I think I need to explain that in a future podcast. Yeah, really. no, I, I, I get that, Pete. I, I think it goes, it comes back to experience again, doesn't it? You know, and I think one of my concerns is, you know, we, we were speaking earlier about idle hands, and I think lots of people have got into trading and some of them have gone into spread betting over the past year um, because they've been at home and they've got cash and they're look, looking for things to do to occupy the time. Um, so a few more people have got into it. And I think I was saying on the last podcast, what I don't want to happen to some of these individuals is that they get into investing or trading or whatever, and they take deeper and deeper and higher risk and they lose out and they miss out on the opportunity to actually become good long-term investors because they get, you know, they get beaten down by, the, the experience that they the short experience they've got which is not a good one if you know what I mean yeah absolutely yeah. yeah and I think that happens with a lot of people and I think it comes back to a game what I was saying that it's like for some strange reason once we get a spread bet account we all become traders yeah it normally yeah. wouldn't do that and, yeah. and, it, and if you I mean 
you could t I mean I'm to, to be fair I'm not perhaps as rigid as I should be and what I mean by that is perhaps in an ideal world what I should do is when I buy Vodafone shares yeah mm. straight away I should buy a long Vodafone spread bet at the same time yeah what I've tended to do in practice, and I probably fool myself that this is a good idea, yeah, is I tend to buy the Vodafone shares, I then give it a little bit of space and see what's happening, and if I see it starting to move up, I then buy the Vodafone spread bet. Now, that may not be the optimal way of doing it, and I might be better off just doing a straight mirror as best I can. But that's you know, something to ponder. Okie dokie. Well, we can, always, we can always come back to this, Pete, to talk yeah, about... Yeah, so, I just, just so, reiterate... So, sorry, before we... Yeah, we'll come back to the future. I just want to reiterate some key points. And that the key point is, you have to ex understand your exposure. If you have a spread bet account or a CFD account, any kind of leverage trading, if you do not understand exposure you should stop doing it now because you are going to get your ass so kicked and what i mean by that it's you need to know the individual exposures to the long side or the short side of the individual positions yeah and you need to know the overall long exposure or the overall short exposure of all the spread bets together of the spread bet portfolio and the thing is it's easy it's like if you if you if you're with ig index Every night, they send you a PDF, which tells you all these numbers. Right at the top, it tells you what your long exposure is, and it breaks down all the individual exposures. There is no excuse for not knowing your exposure. Okie dokie, Pete. Well, well that, we'll cross that as part one, then. I'm not sure any parts this will yeah. take, but we'll, yeah. I think that's a good, a good beginning, Pete, to give people some, some heads up on that. Before we, we've got a couple of things we want to talk about some stocks. We've already done an hour, Pete, so we're going to give it about another 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, well, oh, mate. There are two um, individuals that I keep meaning to, sh to give a shout out to that are on SoundCloud. I'm not sure they're on um, on Twitter. Uh, they're on our SoundCloud um, put, um, platform. And one of them is goes by the name of Stone Circles. And the other one is a lady by the name of Carol Mull Downey. Just wanted to say thank you both for your continued support and all of the um, the listens that you've given our podcast. I think Carol um, may be the person that's lifting all the numbers in Ireland for us. Um, so because the, the numbers of people listening in Ireland has, has, has gone up incrementally over the past couple of um, couple of months. So I just wanted to make sure I just I keep forgetting to say thank you to to Stone Circles and Carol Muldowney. So if you're listening again on on the the, um, the SoundCloud platform, thank you ever so much. Pete, I want you to, to talk quick, very, very quickly about um, a stock, and I, I'm going to be doing this over the next couple of podcasts, um, or a few podcasts going forward, until I've covered all my stocks, and I'm going to be away for the summer, in a sense of not talking about any of the stocks that I own anymore for a good while. Um, yeah. And this, this is a stock that everyone knows, so I'm not going to go into detail about it, and it's called um, Polar Capital. It's a fund management company, and the reason why I purchased this was that I went and met with the management um last early very 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 early last year and um i just liked what they were up to and i love the fact they're in all the different small caps and tech and all the different space and then of course uh, early last year it was tickety boo and everything then went wrong um not just for polar capital but every company um in in march and april so i actually made a purchase of polar capital um at four pound 27 pence on the first of june of 2020 and I've held it um, since then and they've come out with some reasonable results the um, assets under management is going up they're paying a dividend and all the rest of it so it was one I bought basically there's a correlation to the market really so if the markets do well polar capital and fund management companies should do well uh, I've already got um, Premier Mighton um, now I've got um, polar capital and I've got one other fund management company which I'll talk about another time um, but that's, that's what, um, yeah yeah, that's so that's that's one of the ones that um, that I've wanted to disclose um, to to you, ladies and gents, that I've got. That's P O L R. Yeah, that's just correct. noticed that it's paying four point three percent historic dividend. I don't know what the future dividend is, but but that, I mean that's 
that's attractive. Yeah. The other thing I noticed that it's just broken out on a three-year chart. So that's quite a positive bullish sign. I mean, really, with markets really perky, and with one of their big funds being PCT, which I hold, Polar Capital yeah. Technology Trust, um, you know, you can see that one is, is doing going with the markets, isn't it? Obviously. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an it's an interesting company, Pete. I I, I bought it obviously for for the for the dividend, and 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 you you know I've got no love for banks. So that was me trying to get a financial, you know, sort of um, bit of edge there, to use your words, um, yeah. regarding that. And the, the funny thing was, I, I was asked by, um, what's it, Proactive Investor, um, the, the platform, to choose a stock as my stock of the year. Um, so I've, I've chose that, but I'm up against oh. lots of fund managers and all the rest of it <laughs> you know um, mm. i think i'm in um, i was second to last out of i think eight or nine people um on the first quarter so i'm hoping that the share price does a bit better going forward but you know but for me it's a stock that i'm going to hold beyond the year and probably a, bit, a lot longer than that uh, for the dividend because i want to be able to just sleep at night and just compound this the the um the, the performance in my portfolio and it goes back to us um does it there's a the rule of 72 Pete, yes. So, how yeah. long does it how long does it take your your investment to double? And if it goes up seven point two percent, it would have doubled in ten years. Rule of seventy two. Yeah. And and, and he, what what what's it? If it it would take seven point two years if it goes up ten percent a year. Ten percent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and, and all that. Um, mate, um, we mustn't forget a couple of quick things. Um, if you hit the subscribe button on whatever podcast platform you're using. Um, then it doesn't cost you a penny. It's all for free. And basically, you should get a notification when the new podcasts come out. Um, I mean, this one, if all goes to plan, should be out. Well, you should be listening to this probably next weekend. But um, the other thing I need to mention quickly is that um, if you're interested in using SharePad or ShareScope, um, you can actually sign up for it through us because um, we're sponsored by by them, which is fantastic. And thank you to SharePad and ShareScope for that. Um, and um, if you go to their um, subscribe page, if, if you want to start using it, and if you type in Twin Pete's in the promo code box, um, then you can get a discount. You get one month's discount on the data, and we get a little payment for that. So thank you very much for that. We've, we've had quite a few. So thank you for people who've signed up. That's fantastic. And we really appreciate it. And so, so does my, my taste for beer appreciate it. <laughs> um, beer tokens are being collected, Pete. Now, not Pete, not you, that you, I've been able to get to the pub much. Mate, I, 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 keep, I didn't tell you this, did I? I had my day out, mate. I had that, oh, that first Monday. So when the pub, yeah, no, the first day that pub, the pub's open, I, I shocked the wife because you know me, I'm always my head down working and doing this, that, and the other, and chasing this and doing this for charity and doing that. For charity. I was like, you know what? I said on a Sunday night, she thought I was, you know, I thought I was, she thought I was drunk, I think, you know. Um, I said, you know what? Tomorrow, I said, we're going to go out, out. We're going to go out for the afternoon. And she's like looking at me going, it's a Monday. I'm going, nah. Look, you're horrified. We're just going to stop. We're going to stop. We're just going to go out. And my daughter was still off school as well. So we just, the three of us just went out for the day it was it was brilliant it was really nice as watching the world go by you know and yeah. most of the schools near near where we are were, were were back at school and my daughter was still off so yeah so we, we had the place lots of places to ourselves so it was, it was great mate i've got a couple of other stops if you want to hear go for it go for it mate fire them through none of these i hold um this one that has taken my interest is cake box c b o x Yep. Um, you know, that's the one that does vegan cakes and stuff, like you know, like cream cakes and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, their last trading update was pretty good. And um, I think there's a good little growth stock there, a bit of a rollout story with new stores and stuff. Do, do, any thoughts on that one? I've, I've looked at it a couple of times, Pete, and I think the interesting thing about it for me now is that in lockdown, you couldn't go here and you couldn't go there, you couldn't go parties or anything like that. But they were still producing cakes and sending them out and doing and delivering them and all the rest of it. I think as things open up more, yeah, people mm. are going to want to celebrate just the opening up and being able to see each other more, yeah. And what better way to do it than to take, not just take a bottle of something or a, a case of something, but take a nice cake. So I can see that actually doing okay. It could be actually 
a, a play on things reopening. It could actually energise sales going forward rather than some companies which have been locked down plays. I think they could be impacted. I think that could be one that actually does positively out of um, locked, um, people re- having more time to actually spend with each other. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a funny one for me personally. I don't hold it. One of the quandaries I have, apart from the fact that I used to hold, remember that patisserie Valerie that went... Oh, mate, the- yeah, that stirs up some bad memories of some I people, lost mate. I mint on that, and mm-hmm. that was upsetting, and, and obviously that has has the word... That was cake, so it's sort of, you know... You can't obtain every company that has the word cake in it. Oh, but mate, it's just given me this psychological problem. But <laughs> anyway, anyway, the other thing is I hold Hotel Chocolate, H-O-T-C. Oh, of course, and I sort yeah. of think... That's a little bit similar, and you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really like having too many things that are too similar in my portfolio. It just doesn't seem much point. So anyway, um, can you have? Can, you can have your cake and eat the chocolate. You yeah. can. You can have your cake and eat it. I, I see Absolutely. where you go. That's why it's good on that phrase. Hey, I've got another joke for you. I've got to do no! it. No, I got to do it right. Here's my joke, oh. right? I heard this. Oh, on you're going to talk about more stocks, mate. I, I heard this on Steve Wright today, and it so made me giggle. Um, basically, right, I've ordered a chicken and I've ordered an egg from Amazon, and I'll let you know. Oh my gosh! Anyway, right, the other one I want to mention quickly. Um, I think it's called AQX. AQX, I think, is the code. Aquis Exchange. Is that it? AQX. Yeah, Aquis Exchange. Yeah. Now, what it is? This is a weird one, right? Because um, I'm not sure I want to invest in it, and I'm not sure I'm not sure that anyone should invest in it or whatever. I, I've just, to be honest, I don't really know. But I um, saw it at one of those Mellow events on a, on Mellow Monday that David Streder does at Carmen's fella, and it was just it, like I said, there could be an investing opportunity. I really don't know. Yeah, but. There's a wider point, and that is that this Aquis Exchange, they've, they've got some sort of like stock exchange thing going on in France and whatever. And it seems a bit of a fintech play as well. But what they're doing is they bought what used to be the sort of market below aim. Yeah, can you imagine there's a market below aim? Um, and, and it used to be called OFEX and I think the last name was Plus Markets. Yeah, it's had yeah, all yeah. sorts of names and all sorts of iterations. But Aquis Exchange has actually bought it. And listening to the CEO and the plans he's got for it, the things that, you know, they want to make it like AIM, like a proper serious market. And they've got, you know, they're doing, doing um, arrangements with all sorts of, like, brokers and stuff like i don't know like like um aj bell and, and hargrave lanzan they, they should that you should be able to buy shares through aquis exchange through from aquis exchange through hargrave lansdown same you can with aim or whatever and they're, and they're trying to sort of go that way and, and make it into like you know something really amazing so so my point is even if, if you don't necessarily think it's an in, a good investment what i'm saying is it could be a big change happening in the way markets are struck the index yeah the markets and stuff are structured and that perhaps there's going to be a whole host of companies i mean some are, i mean if it's if it's by the old standards of, of opex and stuff i wouldn't want to go near them with yours you know um but if it's if it's like some decent companies on there it could be more stocks you know, potential to invest in or whatever but we need to see how it plays out yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, Pete, because I think they're trying to, to encourage a lot of the the tech, tech, tech sort of small, innovative sort of companies um, attracting them to their platform. Um, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I've, I've heard someone mute that they want to become the NASDAQ of, of the, 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 the London market. You know, essentially, that's what they are. They're an exchange for people to, to place their IPOs on. So, yeah, it's done, it's done well. It IPO'd in um, 2018. Um, placing price of 269, um, giving it a market cap of 73 million. Um, now the shares are six pounds 90 ish or there or thereabouts, and it's got a what's the market cap now? 187. Um, so it's it's come a long way in a very short space of time. Mm. Um, it's up um, one year return 67 percent, nearly 68 percent. 
year to date up 50 percent. so it's it's done well it's been, had a good run since it, um, last august from 320 to um to six pounds nearly seven pounds now so it's doubled in the past um nine months or so so it's had a really 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 good run um can it go higher yeah i mean more ipos on there more generated revenue for them so you know so yeah it's had a good run it's done a lot of marketing as well over that space of time i think it's probably quite a risky one so i think if anyone were, i mean i i'm not sure if it'd be something i'd buy i think i think for me personally there's other stocks that interest me more that are a lot lower risk and, and i'd far rather own but i just think it's an interesting little one and maybe people put a little bit of their portfolio and it don't go mad on it you know um i don't know i, I at the end of the day, people have to make their own decisions. We're, we're not able to give them any I think, I think the, the, thing, the thing about it for me will be what do they attract? Yeah, If they start attracting the SPACs of the world and the, the big te yeah. and some tech Happy and innovative world. companies of the world and they're choosing, rather than going on the FTSE or, or um, the AIM and they go on on uh, on there, that could really, 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 really grow, Pete. But they've tried this platform um, you know, it was always called a third tier or something like that, when it was called Offex, and it's failed countless times. This is the best best start that this new one has got. So whether it's down to the CEO and the management, I don't know, but they've got off to a good start since they IPO'd in 2018. Long may it continue, because I think the beauty of it is, is that if if a, if a good company goes on there, and it opts to then move up to AIM or move across to the London um, FTSE then it's better for keeping innovative companies in the UK. And that's what that's what I'm happy about, because I don't want our companies to be listed on NASDAQ, really. If they, if they can be here and they can grow and can be nurtured, that's better for us, you know? Totally, totally. Yeah. And, and people getting jobs with them as well. No, I think it's, it, it, it's an interesting development, and whether it's an investment or not is, is another decision. But just as a for anyone involved in the markets, it's something to keep tabs on. It, you know, it could be could be more opportunities in the future for trading. Absolutely, mate. Always got to keep tabs on everything. Mm. Now, Pete, we're, we're, we're one hour and 16 minutes in, mate. Do you want to sure. say something closing? What do you want to say? I think we're pretty much done. I mean, the only one, okay, I'll throw one in really fast. Right, I don't hold it. Acrol, A C. RL. Um, it's had a good run. It's the one that does tissue, you know, bog roll and stuff. Yeah, yep. kitchen towels, whatever. It listed on the market with, with a different management. It went really messy, horrible mess. Um, it's got new management. It's totally transforming the business. I was looking at the forecast on it the other day, and it actually looks quite good value when you look at the forecast and stuff. So I'm just highlighting it. I don't own it. Have a look if you want it. Okay, Joe. I'm going to share with you one of my favourite Peter K jokes. Okay? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Right, you ready? I'm going to try not to laugh. I'm going to go silent at the end. A cement mixer collided with a prison van on the Kingston bypass. Motorists are asked to be on the lookout for 16 hardened criminals. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear. Oh no. Oh, I'm in pain. Oh, my, my stomach pain's come back really bad. <laughs> oh, dear. Lacking. There you go, folks. You've had one joke from Pete, or two jokes from Pete now. He's done a second one. You've had one from oh. me. I'm hoping that you will never hear me share another joke on, on this podcast. So I will give you my apologies now. <laughs> oh, dear. Ladies, gents, that's a wrap for Twin Pete's Investing 47. I hope you enjoyed Pete's um, brief synopsis on spread betting. He's going to be talking a bit more about that going forward. I hope you enjoyed some of the stuff we talked about regarding various stocks and our thoughts on them. Um, please stay safe. Please enjoy the improving weather and the, the restrictions being lifted wherever you are. And if you can, as I always say at this time in, in the podcast, please do what you can for someone else. Do something unconditional. Just show some kindness, show some love and do what you can in your communities for anybody that you possibly can. And if you can do it without them even knowing that you're doing it, that's even better. Just go out there and do what you can and just make sure you look after yourselves as well because, you know, we've all got stresses that other people don't even know about. So if you need some help, just reach out and just try and help somebody else but also ask somebody for help if, you, if you're there and you're isolated. Pete? That's it, mate. Fantastic. Thanks for listening, everybody, and um, I'll speak to you next time. Okay, everyone. Ladies and gents, take care. God bless. We look forward to speaking to you again soon. Bye-bye for now. Bye. This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast was brought to you in association with SharePad, 
from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage.